amazing grace of a loving God. Ephesians 4, 7 says, Each of us has received a gift of grace. These gifts are given to us by Christ Jesus. We've gathered together today to celebrate God's wonderful grace. I hope our friends at home will join us in singing number 236, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. For the message, I would invite you to sing with me, He giveth more grace. He giveth more grace. Pat will help us. Feel free to stand as we sing.
Amen. Is it true? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. Oh, God is good. <coughs> Thank you, Pat. In one sentence, how would you describe God? Can you put God in one sentence? Here's how God describes himself in Exodus 36. He's up on Mount Sinai with Moses. And it says, The Lord passed before Moses, and he proclaimed, Jehovah the Lord God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. How's that for a description? That's how he describes himself. Nehemiah prayed, Thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. The psalmist would sing, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Have you seen the theme? The prophet Joel proclaimed, Rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. It seems to be unanimous. Jehovah is a God of graciousness. He's a God of grace. In the Greek language, that's charis. Which means a gift, an undeserved favor, an unmerited blessing. In Ephesians 2 8, we read, For by grace, by some unmerited kindness of the Lord, are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, not our own. Many of us tried to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We tried to be good little Christian boys and girls. We tried to straighten our lives out. much credit should you and I get for the person we are today? The Bible tells us there is nothing that we could do for ourselves spiritually. We could not earn salvation. We would never be able to deserve God's forgiveness. We didn't even know where God was to ask him. For we were lost in our sins. We were dead in our trespasses. We were up a creek without a paddle. Without hope in this world. We had no chance of ever knowing the Heavenly Father or getting close to him. We had no shot at getting into heaven when we died. Except for the grace of God. Now, the grace of God goes far beyond simply forgiveness of sins and eternal salvation. But that's a good place for us to start in our study of grace this morning. Romans chapter 3. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by by what? By my good deeds? Justified freely by my hard work? Being justified freely by all my tithes and offerings? Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 
being justified freely by God's grace. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't wait till we were worthy to come to earth and die in our place? Isn't it a good thing that God didn't wait till we started seeking after Him? But He came to seek and save those who were lost. A modern songwriter puts it this way. You did not wait for me to draw nigh to you, but you clothed yourself in frail humanity. You did not wait for me to cry out to you, but you let me hear your voice calling me. And I'm forever grateful to you. I'm forever grateful for the cross. And I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost. That's us. The Lord did not choose us because we were searching so hard for Him. The, the Lord did not choose us because we were such a smart group of people, or because we were so good looking, or because we were the nicest people in the world. Maybe He chose us because we were the, among the neediest people. Or the most ignorant of people in the world. Or the least able to turn our lives around. Actually, Paul says, we were all sinners. All hopeless sinners. Unable to live right. Unable to connect with God. And no one else could help us. So God, in his goodness and love, reached out to us. That's grace. In Titus 2, Paul says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. God has been gracious toward each one of us. Unconditional grace for all. For all of us who don't deserve it. There are many kinds of grace, many ways in which we experience grace. Let's look this morning at a few ways that God's grace reaches us. Beginning with his saving grace. That's the grace that bridges the gap between us and our Heavenly Father. Jesus, the innocent one, died on the cross for us guilty sinners. And he did it while we were yet sinners. Rebels, wanting nothing to do with God. That's when Jesus came to pay the price. The Good Shepherd came wandering through the wilderness and the mountains, searching for his lost sheep. We were nobodies when God found us. But God, in his grace and compassion, called us, sought us out, drew us unto himself. That's grace. There's also forgiving grace. All of our crimes, all of our mistakes, all of our sins, God forgave as we repented. All our lies, all our deceptions, abuses, evil intentions, angers, gone in an instant. There is no sin beyond his forgiving grace. Christ's blood is able to wash away each and every sin and the guilt that went with it. We thought God would never want us after what we had done. 
we found that the Heavenly Father shows mercy to those who open their hearts to Him. All of our past sins have all been dumped into the sea of God's forgetfulness. Gone forever. Never to be held against us ever again. That is great. Then there's prevenient grace. That's John Wesley's word. For God's grace in our lives, even before we knew him. Grace and mercy working in our lives before we even had faith in God. How early in your life was God watching over you? was God guiding your footsteps so that one day down the road you would come to him. Why do you think it is that you finally accepted Christ as your Savior? Because God's grace was at work in your life enabling you to have Open your heart to him. Then there's providential grace. We know that God provides the basic needs for all of his creatures that he has created. But the Father goes above and beyond for his children. Blessing us in more ways than we can count. More than we deserve. Amen? Far more than we deserve. In fact, God promises that we will not get what we deserve. For we deserve only death, punishment. But we have been blessed beyond measure. Then there's what I call adoptive grace. I think the gracious heart of our Heavenly Father is best revealed in Romans 8.15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Daddy. Oh, so unworthy, and yet chosen, elect, sons of the Most High. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Aren't you? Adopted into the royal family of heaven and named as heirs of the whole kingdom of God with all its rights and privileges. Why? Because we deserve it? No. no. Grace is the word the scriptures use to describe it. The Lord's unfailing, never ending kindness toward us. Number six, healing grace. Have you ever been stuck between a rock and a hard place and couldn't escape? You ever been locked in a jail cell and couldn't get out? A few years ago, I, I took my youth group, fifth and sixth graders, down to the county jail and had them lock us in the jail cell for our Bible study time together. Because I wanted them to get just a little sense of what it means to be trapped. To not be able to help yourself. To not be able to get yourself out of the mess you're in. And I wanted them to know that that was no place to spend your life. Only by God's grace can we ever get free from the shackles of our sin. 
and our addictions and our fears and our guilt and our tempers and our illnesses and our guilty pleasures. The good news of the gospel is that there is victory for every single one of us, but only by God's grace. Number seven, merciful grace. Not only does God forgive all our past sins when we repent and accept Jesus' offer of salvation, but Jesus has also provided forgiveness for all of our future failures and sins and trespasses and iniquities. Now, I would like to think that by now I'm spiritually mature enough that I will never intentionally disobey my Heavenly Father ever again. I would like to think that. But I know me. My feet are made of clay. I'm weak. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And I undoubtedly will need God's forgiveness yet again before I reach heaven's shore. And the good news of the gospel is that his pardon for my future failures is already guaranteed. Marvelous grace. Number eight, unlimited grace. God's amazing grace is available to everyone. Even John Newton, the slave trader, found grace in the eyes of the Lord when he cried out for mercy. And so did Saul of Tarsus. Ephesians 4 says, There's one God and Father of all, and unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Grace unlimited and free, <laughs> available to all. To people of every nationality, every religion, every orientation, Every penitentiary will find grace when they turn to Christ. No matter what their crime, no matter what their sin. Every mother who has aborted a baby can find grace. Every gay couple, every terrorist can know God's grace. There is no limit. Even when you've backslidden 490 times. There is still grace without limit, abundant, amazing grace. J.B. Phillips writes, Indeed, God would save all men if he could. God will achieve the greatest number in heaven that he possibly can. He does not love just some people. He loves all. And will do everything within his loving power to save all he can. God will save the greatest number of people that is actually achievable without violating their free choice. I believe that to be true. Number nine. Heavenly grace. Heaven is that place where everybody wants to go when they die. To spend forever in paradise with God. And Christ has made heaven available to us, but only as a gift. We will never be good enough to get there, even if you're a saint. I think that you and I are going to be surprised by how many people are in heaven with us. Because heaven doesn't depend on our good behavior, but on the 
graciousness of our God. Because it's a gift that can't be earned. First Peter, hope to the end for the grace, the gift that is to be brought unto you at the revelation or the appearing of Jesus Christ. What's that gift of grace that's going to be brought to us when Jesus returns? My Bible tells me that there's a white robe waiting for us. And a mansion. And golden streets. And unspeakable joy. All in the holy city that John saw coming down out of heaven. As a gift. Of God's grace. Always remember, heaven is a gift. Finally, let's speak about daily grace. We all need grace each and every day. None of us is sufficient unto ourselves for even one day. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul tells us, God said to me, unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God's grace fills the gaps when I fall short, when I'm not enough, when I mess up, when I run out. God is there for me and for you. Whatever we need, God's grace is sufficient. In Hebrews 4, we read, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God's grace is always just a prayer away. Jesus said, Ask and ye shall receive. So if God's grace is responsible for all that we are and all that we have, what is our responsibility in response to God's goodness and grace? What does the Father want of us? He wants us to accept His gifts of grace. He wants us to reach out for more. He wants us to embrace His grace. To receive all that Jesus made available to us by going to the cross of Calvary. Don't be satisfied with just a taste of his grace and goodness. We give God our sins. He gives us eternal life. We give God our brokenness. He gives us new birth. We give God our failures. He gives us victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Having God's gift of the Holy Spirit has been compared to getting drunk. Is that fair? Ephesians 5.18 Do not be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. If, if you act stupid, or drive crazy, or mouth off because you're drunk. Or, or if you say or do things that you would never do if you were sober. We say, don't mind him, it's the alcohol talking. It's not me, it's, it's the alcohol. But if the police stops me, who gets the ticket? Because we are responsible for the choices we make, even when the alcohol made us do it. In a similar way, the Holy Spirit causes us to do things we would not naturally do. Right? Like putting our trust in Jesus for salvation. By grace, He calls our name. And he gives us the gift of faith 
so that we can respond to his call. The Holy Spirit is a powerful influence when he comes to us, calling to us. Under his influence, we do things we would not ordinarily do. You and I would never have surrendered to God if not for the grace of God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit invades us, transforms us, draws us to Jesus, and through Jesus to our Heavenly Father. So I came willingly to the cross, but I never would have if the Spirit had not drawn me. That's amazing. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. My response must be gratitude, must be thanksgiving, must be, I must praise him for his gift of grace. For without grace, I would still be dead in my sins. I would still be lost in the darkness. I would still be trapped in my guilt and shame, but for the grace of God. Therefore, I will be forever grateful to the Lord for his amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Would you pray with me? O oh Lord God, thank you for your goodness. You are a gracious, merciful, compassionate God. And we can't comprehend why you have chosen to love us and save us and walk with us. We are so unworthy. And yet every day <clears throat> we see your love and grace and work in our lives and in our world. And we marvel at your unmerited favor. Father, help us to live this week as forgiven children, adopted children, filled with the Holy Spirit children. Help us to live by faith and by grace. And as you have been gracious to us, help us to be gracious toward one another. Merciful, forgiving, compassionate, understanding, and kind. Thank you, Father, for your amazing grace that continues to work in our lives, even this day. Continue your good work in us to make us all we can be until one day we stand together in the Holy City, in your sweet presence, singing together Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. To God be all glory, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Pat's coming back to help us sing together night number 512. Saved by grace. And I shall see him face to face and tell the story. I'm saved by grace. <laughs>
And God is able to make all grace. That means every favor, every earthly blessing, come in abundance to you. So that you may always, under all circumstances, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything. Being completely self-sufficient in Christ. And have an abundance for every good work and act of charity.